This is our last segment of Leviticus. We're going to call it the Holiness Code because in the first half of the book, we've been talking about how to approach God. The sacrifices, the purification, all the steps that had to be taken because we're sinners and he is perfectly pure. The second part of the book is going to be how to maintain, how to live in communion with God, what practices to pursue and which ones to avoid. Why would you think I'd put all these scriptures up from the New Testament? Anybody have a guess? They're all quotations from Leviticus. What's that one in the middle? Leviticus 19.18. It's all over the New Testament. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In the time of Jesus, the Pharisees had said, oh, if you love your neighbor, that means you can hate your enemy. And Jesus explained, God never said hate your enemy. In fact, in Leviticus 19, later in that chapter, we're going to see where God says you are to treat the stranger, the alien, the sojourner, the same as you would a native of the land. So it contradicts that false interpretation right there. So many places. The reason I note this is sometimes we think, hey, you know, Old Testament, all these details, all these specifics. We live in the new age. We're Christians in the time of the church and so forth. There's such value in Leviticus, partly because it's the Hebrews of the Old Testament. And the more we consider one, the better we can grasp the other. New Testament built on the old. And for that reason, very important for us. So this holiness code, as we've suggested, first there's the way to holiness, and now there's the way of holiness, continuing communion with God. Now there are about 11 chapters here, and so we've made one slide for each chapter. We're going to spend a little bit of extra time in chapter 19 especially, but we don't want to rush through the others any more than necessary. So I'm going to look with you at chapter 17, for example, and note a couple of verses there, and then see if you have a comment or question from your study, something that you want to, to ask about or emphasize. Because Israel would be surrounded by Canaanite pagan practices and people in the heathen world would set up altars and they'd worship under trees and they would have things going out all over the place according to whatever religion they desired. That still happens today. Yahweh specified there's going to be one place and you're going to bring all your sacrifices there and if you don't, you'll be cut off from your people. This is so serious. This is so critical that God regulated worship and kept them from going off to the left or the right by limiting their sacrifices to one Place. So in chapter 17, you have the domestic animals, then 13 and 14, the wild animals that hunters might kill, and then animals dying from other causes at the close of the chapter. This phrase, cut off, could mean excommunicated, that is, you're excluded from the fellowship of Israel, or it could mean executed. It's a little bit... Uh, unclear exactly what that consequence was. But because God uses the word blood guiltiness, it suggests that this is so major in God's sight that one who did it might actually be put to death. You mean, what do you mean, just for taking your sacrifice? Yes. God is holy. You're to be holy. You do it God's way. You don't mess with God. You don't negotiate. You fear God, love God, and serve God. Now, if you look down to verse 7, that where it mentions the goat demons, yes, again, part of the behavior of their neighbors. Notice the phrase, play the harlot. To God, idolatry and adultery, in our language, they not only sound alike, but they're often parallel. And so you're married to God. You only have one spouse, one husband. If you go to these goat demons or some other deity of those who don't know the Lord, then you're actually practicing harlotry. You're actually prostituting yourself. And so when they heard those words, we would too. The ESV 
which I'm not using today. I have the New American Standard. ESV uses the word whoring, W-H-O-R-I-N-G. And to me, this is a very strong word. How about you? And it shocked me when I started reading the ESV, which is a Bible I love, happy to use it. But I believe the word would have hit them just that hard. Your thoughts on chapter 17. Anything else you notice you want to point out? Okay, the life is in the blood. We saw in our study of Noah during vacation Bible school that that goes all the way back before Moses regarding uh, the precious value of blood and not consuming blood. Two reasons here, the life principle, the life is in the blood. Blood represents something living, something that God made, it's created, that's special. And the other is, blood was to be used for atonement, uh, reconciling oneself with God. And so you put the two together. Why did God require blood? Because blood is life. Blood's value is beyond our estimation. Don't consume it, but it's required. You know, the book of Hebrews will say, without the shedding of blood, what? There's no forgiveness of sin. All right. Anything else? Chapter 17. Very last verse. Yes, look at that. Uh, uncleanness. And we've also noted that unclean doesn't necessarily mean sinful. That a person could become ritually or ceremonially impure by, let's say, uh, touching an animal or whatever. Uh, in any case, the washing would signify... This was unclean. It could be for hygiene reasons, health reasons, like last week we talked about the clean and unclean animals. But obviously, this was serious to God. What are your other thoughts, Butch? It's a, almost parallel, to baptism. a parallel to baptism. Yeah, yeah, you're unclean until you go through this washing. And the book of Hebrews talks about this in chapter 6. All the regulations, look at Hebrews 6, 1 and following, these elementary doctrines, speaks of all the washings uh, in Old Testament times and compares them to baptism. Good point. Okay, what about uh, 18? Now we come to a long list of people that one must not have relations with. And many of them have to do with incest because they are uh, those within the family. I want to notice that chapter 18 follows what was common in this time, and that is a conquering ruler would establish a treaty or covenant with the people he had subjugated. And it would follow this pattern. First, the ruler would identify himself. Okay, I am Yahweh. I am the Lord God. Then there would be a historical prologue. I rescued you from Egypt. I brought you out on eagle's wings. I took you through the Red Sea. Then there would be stipulations. You do this, you don't do that. And then consequences. You do this, you get blessings. You do this, curses. The Hittites were an ancient people noted in the Old Testament. And for many years, critical skeptics of the Bible said there were never these people, the Hittites. Whoever wrote the Bible made them up to make Israel look important. Until they discovered the Hittite civilization and the library with many ancient documents. And here they discovered that Hittite rulers used this same layout, this same blueprint, for their dealings with people that they conquered. I want to notice with you uh, by which a man will live if he does them. Look at verse 5. If a man or woman perfectly, without mistake, consistently, never failing, obeyed every single command given in the Torah, could that person theoretically 
live in the presence of God? In theory, yes. If you do all these things, you will live. Who has done that through history? Was there ever a Jew who 110% followed through on everything God said to do, other than Jesus the Christ? No. Turn in your Bible to Galatians 3, and there you will see Paul, by inspiration, notes this principle that if you lived sinlessly, you could come into the presence of God. But no one has done that. And so he says, quoting also from the Torah, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the law. And so he says in verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse, having become a curse for us, because it's written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So here's the argument. If you live sinlessly, you can stand before God. You haven't. The entire Old Testament reveals that. Peter said in Acts 15.10, Acts 15.10, why would we put a yoke on the neck of the Gentiles that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? The law convicts. The law diagnoses. The law says you're in a heap of trouble. You need a savior. You need forgiveness. You need blood atonement. The law says if you did all this perfectly, yes, but you haven't. And so Paul, then looking back on it, as a Jew himself, said, we're under a curse, and we can't fix it ourselves. Jesus had to come in and be the curse for us through the cross. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And then uh, notice 19 to 23, certain times uh, and situations they were not to be involved with. Child sacrifice is a problem uh, throughout the Old Testament. There was a pagan god named Molech. And uh, people in the pagan areas would sacrifice in the fire their own children. Wouldn't be a good Father's Day, would it? I mean, they thought they could appease Molech by giving what was most precious to them, their sons. And so that's prohibited here. Uh, male with male, of course, an abomination to God, a bestiality, relations with an animal, a perversion in the sight of God. And then he'll say at the end of the chapter, if you do these things, what? The land will regurgitate you. Just like God brought the Canaanites out, dispossessed them because of these practices. If you do what the Canaanites did, you'll get what the Canaanites got. You'll be vomited out. Anything else on 18? Yes. Okay. That's a good question, you know, and uh, in a way the same with Noah. I think uh, Sherry's asking about Enoch, who walked with God, and he was not. God took him. He was right with God. The same thing was true with Noah, chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 8. He alone found favor with God. One thing we have to remember is that Enoch and Noah lived before the law. And so the idea that these laws, one could be right with God by observing all these things, that was not their situation. And apparently, God spared them through their faith, not through their perfection, but Noah, uh, when the Bible says Noah was a righteous man, doesn't mean, you know, no one's good but God. That's true. But Noah was right with God. He, he was faithful. He walked by the truth that God gave him. Very good question. Anybody else on that? Okay. All right. So, uh, 19. I want to, uh, as we noted take some time here because there's so much emphasis on respect for other human beings. Kindness, compassion, tenderness. If you ever think that Leviticus is all boom, 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 uh, notice what you see here. Um, verse 9. Now when you reap the harvest of your land, 
You shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. The poor, those that could not work, that don't have what you have, you make a point that they can come and pick up free of charge some of what you have worked for. Now, why would you do that? He's going to come to the principle, verse 18, love your neighbors yourself. But here are the reasons given. I'm Yahweh. Part of your harvest does not belong to you. God has set it aside for someone less fortunate. Someone who's struggling. Someone who's hurting. Someone that's weak. Maybe they're homeless. Maybe they lost their job. Maybe their family has broken up. And they don't have the earning power that you do. It's a great, great principle. Do you think of a setting in the Old Testament in which something like this happened? Baruch and a man named Boaz said to his, he said, you leave some of the things there for her to glean. And it was through Boaz's kindness and, of course, Ruth's willingness to work, the beautiful uh, providence of God, that, uh, that they came together and became ancestors of David and, of course, Christ. Then he goes on to say, uh, you don't steal or deal falsely or lie to one another. Doesn't this sound like the Ten Commandments? They're being restated over and over and over again. Don't swear falsely by my name. Don't profane the name. Let's talk about the word profane. Do you have that word, verse 12? We know the word profanity. And we think of certain words that people speak that they shouldn't. They're vulgar. They're ugly. They may be blasphemous and evil. The word profane originally means to make common. Profanity is the opposite of holiness. If you treat everything as if it's just unimportant, insignificant, doesn't belong to God, uh, if you talk about God in a way that makes him common or brings him down, you're profaning the things of God, the name of God, the ways of God. Don't oppress a neighbor. Don't rob him. The wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night until morning. You give him his check today. He worked for you today. He needs that. Don't curse a deaf man. Don't place a stumbling block before the blind. Why? Because you revere Yahweh. The blind and the deaf might have been regarded as less worthy, maybe punished by God for something wrong in their lives, easy to ignore them or mistreat them or make fun of them. But imagine putting a stumbling block in front of them. Who would do that? And so, again, this idea of awareness of people that don't have what you have and don't enjoy what you enjoy. Uh, no injustice in judgment. Don't be partial to the poor. Don't defer to the great. In other words, justice is blind. You don't uh, treat people differently based on their, their place on the economic scale or the social ladder. Don't slander. Don't talk down about people. These are your people. I like that phrase, your people. Don't act against the life of your neighbor. Don't hate your fellow countrymen. You may reprove your neighbor. What do you suggest reprove means? Prove that certain things are true about the person and the way they need to live. Correct them. Help them to live straight. Get it right. Loving your neighbor is tough love. It doesn't mean that you're always, oh, everything's fine, fine. There may be a time for confrontation. But don't sin. How would you sin if you hated him? If you became proud, if you looked down your nose at him, that would be sin. Correct him, yes, but watch your attitude and your heart. Don't take vengeance. That's Romans 12. Vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. Don't get even. Don't bear any grudge against the sons of your people. What do you think of with a grudge? Something you let fester and grow and build. When I hear the word grudge, I think about... Herodias 
in Mark chapter 6 and how she was so upset when John the Baptist confronted her and her husband who had taken her from his brother. And the Bible says in some versions that Herodias nursed a grudge against John. And it built and it built and it built until the only thing that would satisfy her was what? Cut off his head. Someone said you have to nurse a grudge to keep it alive. If you don't feed it, if you don't nourish it, if you don't let it grow and grow and grow, it won't survive. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Verse 18. What comments do you have about these principles or teachings about one another that certainly carry over to the new covenant? An attitude of the heart. And once again, sometimes people picture the law as only external, do's and don'ts, you check these boxes, you cross your T's, you dot your I's. And notice the emphasis on the inward um, outlook. One of the things I notice too is you treat your neighbor this way, not because your neighbor is perfect, or because they did something good for you first, or they're going to reciprocate and pay you back. Why do you do this for your neighbor? I am Yahweh. You mistreat one of your people, you deal with the Lord of heaven and earth. And human tendency sometimes is to pigeonhole people, to figure out where they rate on the scale. I'm gonna do this for this person because this, 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 this. You know what Jesus said, Luke 14? Jesus said, when you give a dinner, don't invite your neighbors, your relatives, and your rich friends. Why? They're going to have you back, and you'll be repaid. When you have a dinner, you invite the crippled, and the blind, and the lame. Even though they cannot pay you back, he will. Other thoughts you have, chapter 19. Yes. yes. Think of love as all sweet. And... Yes. 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 Good. Janice has talked about love as not just some easy, wishy-washy kind of thing, but like Jesus loved. It's radical. It's costly. It is demanding. It is sacrificial. It is hard work to practice love. So it's not hard because it comes from the heart, but still it takes diligence and concentration and, and effort. Loving is giving people what God wants them to have telling them what God wants them to hear. And I think this is one way to distinguish between tender love and tough love. And we're seeing this in uh, the week that changed the world in our sermon series, how tender and soft and kind Jesus is to broken people and how tough and rigid and challenging we're about to see probably next Lord's Day how he takes on the Pharisees. He loved the Pharisees, and he told them what they needed to hear. There's another hand. David? Yes. He's talking to us today. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. Look around us today. Yes. Look at all the uh, sexual and gender, all the confusion in the world today. And you read Leviticus, you know, you're not to do this with this person, this person. And, you know, 
David is saying what was going on then is going on now. And the word of God is unchanging. The principles, the bedrock truths, we need to hear over and over and over again. Yes, Chris? Good. Good. Chris has mentioned he is the same yesterday, today, and forever from Hebrews 13. And how important it is that we understand the things that don't change. As we look at Leviticus, we recognize things about sacrifices and the priest and the special clothes and all the routine and rituals they went through. That the, the old covenant, you know, we read in Colossians 2, the, nailed to the cross. But if we take that to mean that the Old Testament principles don't apply to us, all we have to do is read Hebrews and read Romans and Galatians and all the New Testament, and we see the fallacy of that. For example, I think of James chapter 2. James 2 talks about two different people that come into the assembly. One is well-dressed, looks sharp, pillar in the community. So you say, hey, sit here on the front pew. By the way, we always have room on the front pew. Have you notice that? And someone else comes in disheveled, you know, kind of from the other side of the tracks. We say, well, you know, we got a spot for you, you know, go back there, that kind of thing. And James says, you've become judges with evil motives. And so it's the same principle as this passage. Kent. Kent. Timing. Do you have to call it out for what it is? Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, Ephesians 4.15 says what? Speaking the truth in love. Knowing the right thing to say to the right person at the right time in the right way is something that nobody gets perfectly, right? Right? But the idea that some things need to be addressed and in the Lord's church, often I'm convinced this is one of the only places where we can talk about things openly. But we need to go outside these walls, but always in the spirit of love. I, Kent, I like the passage. If you turn to 2 Timothy 2.24, 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but gentle to all, patient when wronged, with kindness correcting, yes, correcting, with kindness correcting those who are in opposition so that God might grant them repentance and they might come to the truth. If their relationship with God could benefit from my saying something or doing something. Let me pray and ask God to help me with the right words and the right attitude. Saw a couple of hands over here. Yes, Erica. Yes, 
Your intention, love is an intention, and hate is an intention. Discerner of the intents of the heart. Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Love is the intent. It's a decision. It's a conviction. It's a determination. I think it's Romans twelve nine that says, "Let love be without hypocrisy." Uh, King James has "without dissimulation," which is an old word that. Uh, genuine and real and true. There was another. Is there another hand? Dave? Summarize the Ten Commandments again. Ten times, I am Yahweh. I'm the Lord your God. Yes, these commandments came from God. But, I'm the Lord. What about I'm the Lord. You know, do you know this person? I am the Lord. <laughs> and this is how you treat every other person. Steve. Well, scripture says in the law that God takes his young child just like we do with our children as young age. Right. right. Before they understand why, you cannot have a good That three year old doesn't understand too many cookies to make you sick. I'm your dad. I'm your mom. You do this because I said so. Yes. 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 Spoken as a true dad, right? When they're young, you say, this is the way it is. You don't follow this. You will pay the price. And be sure to be consistent. You know, Proverbs talks often about, uh, about correcting your child and the consequences of misbehavior. And the child says, why, why, why? Because I'm your dad. You know, I'm your mom. And then as the children get older, what? They start to understand. We can reason with them. But if we start out with children and say, now you're going to do this because, you know, yeah, you're going to do this because, and we give them all these other things. This is, you're going to like this. You know, you do this, you get this, you get this. If, if we do that and we neglect parental authority, both they and we will pay for it as the years go on. And Steve said the same thing in the church. As we mature, we can understand more. Steve, this is the nature of God. You know, and Jesus will say that in Matthew 5, you love your enemies. Why? Because God sends the rain and the sun on everybody, and you want to prove that you're his children. How do you prove that God is your father? You act like God toward people that, that maybe don't go for you. That's what God did. Very good. Okay, I wanted to say, too, um, consistency and unity. We're not told exactly why they were not to mix cattle or mix their seed, or mix the material. Once again, something where it's simply told. So what you see in parentheses are just some possibilities. But again, just like with the clean and unclean animals, uh, no explanation was given. So uh, here we are further. I found this interesting at 23 through 25. The fruit is forbidden for three years, that the Hebrew word is the word uncircumcised. Unusual, isn't it? Uncircumcised would suggest, you know, that's not who we are. That's not what we do. You know, uh, we don't get involved with this or that. Uncircumcised. And so then in the fourth year, I found this noteworthy also. You finally get past the third year, 
and the grain comes, the fruit, wouldn't you want to eat it? The fact that in that fourth year you wouldn't eat it, you would devote it to Yahweh, would be an act of faith. Been waiting three years. Now it's coming. It's not yours. It's his. In the fifth year, you can eat. Well, we need to say something about uh, 26 through 29. Apparently, there were certain practices among the Canaanites that included cutting the hair a certain way, marking the body, cutting the body. There were different omens. There were different things that people did to themselves to appease some god. So uh, when you see the word tattoo and is it carried over to today and many of us were not, uh, not favorable, we don't promote tattoos, but if you go to this verse and you pull out tattoos from this verse alone, you've got to realize it's part of a context that's dealing with haircuts, with haircuts, don't cut your hair. So these were apparently matters that would uh, separate the Israelites from the pagans. Okay, and then uh, no mediums, no people that call up the dead. I like this about respect for the gray-headed elderly. How do you like that? You know, I, uh, I like to tell people I color my hair so I get more respect. But it doesn't always work, you know, and of course I don't. But I like white hair. I get a haircut, I tell, I say, just cut the, just cut the gray and the white. So the next thing I know is a big pile of stuff on the floor. Uh, love your neighbor is the stranger. Look at verse 34. So again, Matthew 5, when the Pharisees had made up something that wasn't there, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. No, it's right there in Leviticus uh, regarding the stranger. Let me move on now. Uh, Dr. Coy Roper, a good friend, a colleague at Heritage Christian University, he wrote the red commentary in Truth for Today. And, and these are some things he noted. These are in the notes you received in your email, so I want to need to move on. So I think some of these things we've already talked about. A summary and reminder. Uh, the land will vomit you out. You should obey God. He's given you this good land. And he set you apart. That's holiness. So uh, holiness of the priests. Priests were held to a higher standard. And it's important for us to notice. God does not reject a person because they are deaf or because they are blind. We've already seen that in chapter 19. You show respect and generosity and love. On the other hand, a deaf man or a blind man could not serve as a priest. You see this in the New Testament as well. Sometimes there may be a distinction in who's allowed to do what. You know, we talk about men and women in the church. It's not that one gender is more valuable than the other, but God has specified who may do what. And so, here are some uh, things that the priests were to observe because they interceded with the holy God. So Israel is to be holy compared to the nations. The priests are to be holy even compared to their fellow Israelites. Okay, the offerings, chapter 22. Remember that the offerings were partly for food, for the priest and for the family uh, to be able to eat. Okay, uh, the appointed occasions. I think we've gone through these various times uh, in, our, in our study. And they're listed there for you as to how they were observed. I want to make a note about the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. Here's New Testament again. Um, John chapter 7. This is where uh, for uh, eight days in Jesus' time, they would live in booths, temporary shelters, for eight days, reminiscent of this experience of their ancestors in the uh, Old Testament, in the period of Moses. So once a week, you leave your house. No, you don't go to your RV. No. You, no, you don't spend the week on the lake. No, no, no. You get twigs and branches, and you build yourself a little hut, and you live in it for eight days. So Jesus and others of his time observed this, and Jesus used this to explain, because at the Feast of Booths, the priest would pour out water. And Jesus said, John 7, 37 and 38, go look at it. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. 
He was talking about the Holy Spirit. And he did this as a parallel with the Feast of Booths. All right, the lamps, I think we've covered a lot of this in Exodus, haven't we? Here in the middle of chapter 24, you have uh, blasphemy. There is the man who's the son of an Israelite mother, and, but he has an Egyptian father, a mixed marriage. Perhaps because of that, he doesn't have as much regard for the name Yahweh. And so he uses it lightly. He uses it flippantly. He uses it perhaps like we hear all around us today. And he's stoned to death. You don't mess with the name of God. You don't treat it trivially. trivially. Uh, it's always with awe. It's always with wonder. It's always with praise that you mention Yahweh, the name of God. The eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was meant to limit the punishment to where it fit the crime. Uh, if you knock out somebody's tooth, he doesn't get to take uh, all your teeth out, that kind of thing. And that was not for a personal vengeance, by the way. You don't take vengeance. We saw that. That was for the leadership of Israel to deal with that. Well, sabbatical year, uh, year of jubilee, kindness to the poor. Maybe we can pick up a little bit with this next time so we don't uh, totally overlook it. But you should have this in your notes that went out by email, obedience and disobedience. Even when you disobey, if you repent, God will bring you back from the land. And then uh, the summary of Leviticus. So we'll try to take a little more time with that. Thank you for being in our class. Remember the cards in the box. And also remember the other events coming up in our schedule.